Chapter Four B of Anderson's Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathy Wright. Anderson's Fairy Tales by Hans Christian Anderson. The Shoes of Fortune, Chapter Four B. Part four a moment of head importance an evening's dramatic readings a most strange journey every inhabitant of copenhagen knows from personal inspection how the entrance to frederick's hospital looks but as it is possible that others who are not copenhagen people may also read this little work we will beforehand give a short description of it the extensive building is separated from the street by a pretty high railing, the thick iron bars of which are so far apart that in all seriousness it is said some very thin fellow had of a night occasionally squeezed himself through to go and pay his little visits in the town. The part of the body most difficult to manage on such occasion was, no doubt, the head. Here as is so often the case in the world, long-headed people get through best. So much, then, for our introduction. One of the young men, whose head, in a physical sense only, might be said to be of the thickest, had the watch that evening. The rain poured down in torrents, yet despite these two obstacles, the young man was obliged to go out, if it were but for a quarter of an hour and as to telling the doorkeeper about it that he thought was quite unnecessary if with a whole skin he were able to slip through the railings there on the floor lay the galoshes which the watchman had forgotten he never dreamed for a minute that they were those of fortune and they promised to do him good service in the wet so he put them on the question now was if he could squeeze himself through the grating for he had never tried before. Well, there he stood. "'Would to heaven I had got my head through,' said he, involuntarily. And instantly, through it slipped, easily and without pain, notwithstanding it was pretty large and thick. But now the rest of the body was to be got through. "'Ah, I am much too stout,' groaned he aloud, while fixed as in a vice. I had thought the head was the most difficult part of the matter. Oh, oh, I really cannot squeeze myself through. He now wanted to pull his over-hasty head back again, but he could not. For his neck there was room enough, but for nothing more. His first feeling was of anger. His next, that his temper fell to zero. The shoes of fortune had placed him in the most dreadful situation, and unfortunately it never occurred to him to wish himself free. The pitch-black clouds poured down their contents in still heavier torrents. Not a creature was to be seen in the streets. To reach up to the bell was what he did not like. To cry aloud for help would have availed him little. Besides, how ashamed would he have been to be found caught in a trap like an outwitted fox? how was he to twist himself through he saw clearly that it was his irrevocable destiny to remain a prisoner till dawn or perhaps even late in the morning then the smith must be fetched to file away the bars but all that would not be done so quickly as he could think about it the whole charity school just opposite would be in motion all the new booths with their not very courtier-like swarm of seamen would join them out of curiosity and would greet him with a wild hurrah while he was standing in his pillory there would be a mob a hissing and rejoicing and jeering ten times worse than in the rows about the jews some years ago oh my blood is mounting to my brain tis enough to drive one mad i shall go wild i know not what to do oh were i but loose my dizziness would then cease oh were my head but loose you see he ought to have said that sooner for the moment he expressed the wish his head was free and cured of all his paroxysms of love he hastened off to his room 
where the pains consequent on the fright the shoes had prepared for him did not so soon take their leave but you must not think that the affair is over now it grows much worse the night passed the next day also but nobody came to fetch the shoes in the evening dramatic readings were to be given at the little theatre in king street the house was filled to suffocation and among other pieces to be recited was a new poem by h c anderson called my aunt's spectacles the contents of which were pretty nearly as follows a certain person had an aunt who boasted of particular skill in fortune-telling with cards and who was constantly being stormed by persons that wanted to have a peep into futurity but she was full of mystery about her art in which a certain pair of magical spectacles did her essential service her nephew a merry boy who was his aunt's darling begged so long for these spectacles that at last she lent him the treasure after having informed him with many exhortations that in order to execute the interesting trick he need only to repair to some place where a great many persons were assembled and then from a higher position whence he could overlook the crowd pass the company in review before him through his spectacles immediately the inner man of each individual would be displayed before him like a game of cards in which he unerringly might read what the future of every person presented was to be well pleased the little magician hastened away to prove the powers of the spectacles in the theatre no place seeming to him more fitted for such a trial he begged permission of the worthy audience and set his spectacles on his nose a motley phantasmagoria presented itself before him which he describes in a few satirical touches yet without expressing his opinion openly he tells the people enough to set them all thinking and guessing but in order to hurt nobody he wraps his witty oracular judgments in a transparent veil or rather in a lurid thundercloud shooting forth bright sparks of wit that they may fall in the powder magazine of the expectant audience the humorous poem was admirably recited and the speaker much applauded among the audience was the young man of the hospital who seemed to have forgotten his adventure of the preceding night he had on the shoes for as yet no lawful owner had appeared to claim them and besides it was so very dirty out of doors they were just the thing for him he thought the beginning of the poem he praised with great generosity he even found the idea original and effective but that the end of it like the rhine was very insignificant proved in his opinion the author's want of invention he was without genius etc this was an excellent opportunity to have said something clever meanwhile he was haunted by the idea he should like to possess such a pair of spectacles himself then perhaps by using them circumspectly one would be able to look into the people's hearts which he thought would be far more interesting than merely to see what was to happen next year for that we should all know in proper time but the other never i can now said he to himself fancy the whole row of ladies and gentlemen sitting there in the front row if one could but see into their hearts yes that would be a revelation a sort of bazaar in that lady yonder so strangely dressed i should find for certain a large milliner's shop in that one the shop is empty but it wants cleaning plain enough but there would also be some good stately shops among them alas sighed he i know one in which all is stately but there sits already a spruce young shopman which is the only thing that's amiss in the whole shop all would be splendidly decked out and we should hear walk in gentlemen pray walk in here you will find all you please to want ah i wish to heaven i could walk in and take a trip right through the hearts of those present and behold to the shoes of fortune this was the cue 
the whole man shrunk together, and a most uncommon journey through the hearts of the front row of spectators now began. The first heart through which he came was that of a middle-aged lady, but he instantly fancied himself in the room of the institution for the cure of the crooked and deformed, where casts of misshapen limbs were displayed in naked reality on the wall. Yet there was this difference. In the institution the casts were taken at the entry of the person, but here they were retained and guarded in the heart while the sound persons went away. They were, namely, casts of female friends, whose bodily or mental deformities were here most faithfully preserved. With the snake-like writhings of an idea he glided into another female heart, but this seemed to him like a large holy fane. The white dove of innocence fluttered over the altar. How gladly would he have sunk upon his knees! but he must away to the next heart. Yet he still heard the pealing tones of the organ, and he himself seemed to have become a newer and a better man. He felt unworthy to tread the neighboring sanctuary, which a poor garret with a sick bedrid mother revealed. But God's warm sun streamed through the open window. Lovely roses nodded from the wooden flower-boxes on the roof, and two sky-blue birds sang rejoicingly, while the sick mother implored God's richest blessings on her pious daughter. He now crept on hands and feet through a butcher's shop. At least on every side and above and below there was naught but flesh. It was the heart of a most respectable rich man, whose name is certain to be found in the directory. He was now in the heart of the wife of this worthy gentleman. It was an old, dilapidated, mouldering dovecote. The husband's portrait was used as a weathercock, which was connected in some way or other with the doors, and so they opened and shut of their own accord whenever the stern old husband turned round. Hereupon he wandered into a boudoir, formed entirely of mirrors, like the one in Castle Rosenberg. But here the glasses magnified to an astonishing degree. On the floor, in the middle of the room, sat like a Dalai Lama, the insignificant self of the person, quite confounded at his own greatness. He then imagined he had got into a needle case full of pointed needles of every size. This is certainly the heart of an old maid, thought he. But he was mistaken. It was the heart of a young military man, a man, as people said, of talent and feeling. In the greatest perplexity, he now came out of the last heart in the row. He was unable to put his thoughts in order, and fancied that his too lively imagination had run away with him. "'Good heavens!' said he. "'I have surely a disposition to madness. "'Tis dreadfully hot here. "'My blood boils in my veins, and it, my head is burning like a coal.' And he now remembered the important event of the evening before, how his head had got jammed in between the iron railings of the hospital. That's what it is, no doubt, he said. I must do something in time. Under such circumstances, a Russian bath might do me good. I only wish I were already on the upper bank. And so, there he lay on the uppermost bank in the vapor bath, but with all his clothes on, in his boots and galoshes, while the hot drops fell scalding from the ceiling on his face. Hello! cried he, leaping down. The bathing attendant, on his side, uttered a loud cry of astonishment when he beheld in the bath a man completely dressed. The other, however, retained sufficient presence of mind to whisper to him, "'Tis a bet, and I've won it." But the first thing he did, as soon as he got home, was to have a large blister put on his chest and back to draw out his madness. The next morning he had a sore chest and a bleeding back, and, accepting the fright, that was all that he had gained by the shoes of fortune. Part Five, Metamorphosis of the Copying Clerk The watchman, whom we have certainly not forgotten, thought meanwhile of the galoshes he had found and taken with him to the hospital. 
he now went to fetch them and as neither the lieutenant nor anybody else in the street claimed them as his property they were delivered over to the police office why i declare the shoes look just like my own said one of the clerks eyeing the newly found treasure whose hidden powers even he sharp as he was was not able to discover one must have more than the eye of a shoemaker to know one pair from the other said he soliloquizing and putting at the same time the galoshes in search of an owner beside his own in the corner here sir said one of the men who panting brought him a tremendous pile of papers the copying clerk turned round and spoke a while with the man about the reports and legal documents in question but when he had finished and his eye fell again on the shoes he was unable to say whether those to the left or those to the right belonged to him at all events it must be those which are wet thought he but this time in spite of his cleverness he guessed quite wrong for it was just those of fortune which played as it were into his hands or rather on his feet and why i should like to know are the police never to be wrong so he put them on quickly stuck his papers in his pocket and took besides a few under his arm intending to look them through at home to make the necessary notes it was noon and the weather that had threatened rain began to clear up while gaily dressed holiday folks filled the streets a little trip to fredericksburg would do me no great harm thought he for i poor beast of burden that i am have so much to annoy me that i don't know what a good appetite is tis a bitter crust alas at which i am condemned to gnaw nobody could be more steady or quiet than this young man we therefore wish him joy of the excursion with all our heart and it will certainly be beneficial for a person who leads so sedentary a life in the park he met a friend one of our young poets who told him that the following day he should set out on his long intended tour so you are going away again said the clerk you are a very free and happy being we others are chained by the leg and held fast to our desk yes but it is a chain friend which ensures you the blessed bread of existence answered the poet you need feel no care for the coming morrow when you are old you receive a pension true said the clerk shrugging his shoulders and yet you are better off to sit at one's ease and poetize that is a pleasure everybody has something agreeable to say to you and you are always your own master no friend you should but try what it is to set from one year's end to the other occupied with and judging the most trivial matters the poet shook his head the copying clerk did the same each one kept to his own opinion and so they separated it's a strange race those poets said the clerk who was very fond of soliloquizing i should like some day just for a trial to take such nature up on me and be a poet myself i am very sure i should make no such miserable verses as the others to-day methinks is a very delicious day for a poet nature seems anew to celebrate her awakening into life the air is so unusually clear the clouds sail on so buoyantly and from the green herbage a fragrance is exhaled that fills me with delight for many a year have i not felt as at this moment we see already by the foregoing effusion that he is become a poet to give further proof of it however would in most cases be insipid for it is a most foolish notion to fancy a poet different from other men among the latter there may be far more poetical natures than many an acknowledged poet when examined more closely could boast of the difference only is that the poet possesses a better mental memory on which account he is able to retain the feeling and the thought till they can be embodied by means of words 
a faculty which the others do not possess. But the transition from a commonplace nature to one that is richly endowed demands always a more or less breakneck leap over a certain abyss which yawns threateningly below, and thus must the sudden change with the clerk strike the reader. The sweet air, continued he of the police office, in his dreamy imaginings, how it reminds me of the violets in the garden of my Aunt Magdalena. Yes, then I was a little wild boy, who did not go to school very regularly. Oh, heavens! Tis a long time since I have thought on those times. The good old soul! She lived behind the exchange. She always had a few twigs or green shoots in the water. Let the winter rage without, as it might. The violets exhaled their sweet breath whilst I pressed against the window-panes covered with fantastic frost-work the copper coin I had heated on the stove, and so made peepholes. What splendid vistas were then open to my view! What change! What magnificence! Yet in the canal lay the ships frozen up, and deserted by their whole crews, with a screaming crow for the sole occupant. But when the spring— with a gentle stirring motion announced her arrival, a new and busy life arose. With songs and hurrahs the ice was sawn asunder, the ships were fresh tarred and rigged, that they might sail away to distant lands. But I have remained here, must always remain here, sitting at my desk in the office, and patiently see other people fetch their passports to go abroad. Such is my fate, alas! sighed he, and was again silent. Great heaven! What is come to me? Never have I thought or felt like this before. It must be the summer air that affects me, with feelings almost as disquieting as they are refreshing. He felt in his pocket for the papers. The police reports will soon stem the torrent of my ideas, and effectually hinder any rebellious overflowing of the time-worn banks of official duties, he said to himself consolingly, while his eyes ran over the first page. Dame Tigbreth. Tragedy in five acts. What is that? And yet it is undeniably my own handwriting. Have I written the tragedy? Wonderful! very wonderful and this what have i here intrigue on the ramparts or the day of repentance vaudeville with new songs to the most favoured heirs the deuce where did i get all this rubbish some one must have slipped it slyly into my pocket for a joke there is too a letter to me a crumpled letter and the seal broken. Yes, it was not a very polite epistle from the manager of a theatre, in which both pieces were flatly refused. Hem! Hem! said the clerk breathlessly, and quite exhausted he seated himself on a bank. His thoughts were so elastic, his heart so tender, and involuntarily he picked one of the nearest flowers. It is a simple daisy just bursting out of the bud. What the botanist tells us, after a number of imperfect lectures, the flower proclaimed in a minute. It related the mythos of its birth, told of the power of the sunlight that spread out its delicate leaves, and forced them to impregnate the air with their incense. And then he thought of the manifold struggles of life, which in like manner awakened the budding flowers of feeling in our bosom. Light and air contend with chivalric emulation for the love of the fair flower that bestowed her chief favors on the latter. Full of longing, she turned towards the light, and as soon as it vanished, rolled her tender leaves together and slept in the embraces of the air. "'It is the light which adorns me,' said the flower. "'But tis the air which enables thee to breathe,' said the poet's voice." Close by stood a boy who dashed his stick into a wet ditch. The drops of water splashed up to the green leafy roof, 
and the clerk thought of the million of ephemera which in a single drop were thrown up to a height that was as great doubtless for their size as for us if we were to be hurled above the clouds while he thought of this and of the whole metamorphosis he had undergone he smiled and said i sleep and dream but it is wonderful how one can dream so naturally and know besides so exactly that it is but a dream if only to-morrow on awaking i could again call all to mind so vividly i seem in unusually good spirits my perception of things is clear i feel as light and cheerful as though i were in heaven but i know for a certainty that if to-morrow a dim remembrance of it should swim before my mind it will then seem nothing but stupid nonsense as i have often experienced already especially before i enlisted under the banner of the police for that dispels like a whirlwind all the visions of an unfettered imagination all we hear or say in a dream that is fair and beautiful is like the gold of the subterranean spirits it is rich and splendid when it is given us but viewed by daylight we find only withered leaves alas he sighed quite sorrowfully and gazed at the chirping birds that hopped contentedly from branch to branch they are much better off than i to fly must be a heavenly art and happy do i prize that creature in which it is innate yes could i exchange my nature with any other creature i fain would be such a happy little lark he had hardly uttered these hasty words when the skirts and sleeves of his coat folded themselves together into wings the clothes became feathers and the galoshes claws he observed it perfectly and laughed in his heart now then there is no doubt that i am dreaming but i never before was aware of such mad freaks as these and up he flew into the green roof and sang but in the song there was no poetry for the spirit of the poet was gone the shoes as is the case with anybody who does what he has to do properly could only attend to one thing at a time he wanted to be a poet and he was one he now wished to be a merry chirping bird but when he was metamorphosed into one the former peculiarity ceased immediately it is really pleasant enough said he the whole day long i sit in the office amid the driest law papers and at night i fly in my dream as a lark in the gardens of fredericksburg one might really write a very pretty comedy up on it he now fluttered down into the grass turned his head gracefully on every side and with his bill pecked the pliant blades of grass which in comparison to his present size seemed as majestic as the palm branches of northern africa unfortunately the pleasure lasted but a moment presently black night overshadowed our enthusiast who had so entirely missed his part of copying clerk at the police office some vast object seemed to be thrown over him it was a large oilskin cap which a sailor boy of the quay had thrown over the struggling bird a coarse hand sought its way carefully in under the broad rim and seized the clerk over the back and wings in the first moment of fear he called indeed as loud as he could you impudent little blackguard i am a copying clerk at the police office and you know you cannot insult any belonging to the constabulary force without a chastisement besides you good-for-nothing rascal it is strictly forbidden to catch birds in the royal gardens of fredericksburg but your blue uniform betrays where you come from this fine tirade sounded however to the ungodly sailor boy like a mare beep 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 he gave the noisy bird a knock on its beak and walked on he was soon met by two schoolboys of the upper class that is to say as individuals for with regard to learning they were in the lowest grades in the school and they bought the stupid bird so the copying clerk came to copenhagen as guest or rather as prisoner in a family living in gother street tis well that i'm dreaming said the clerk or i really should get angry first i was a poet 
now sold for a few pence as a lark. No doubt it was that accursed poetical nature which has metamorphosed me into such a poor harmless little creature. It is really pitiable, particularly when one gets into the hands of a little blackguard, perfect in all sorts of cruelty to animals. All I should like to know is how the story will end. The two schoolboys, the proprietors now of the transformed clerk, carried him into an elegant room. A stout, stately dame received them with a smile, but she expressed much dissatisfaction that a common field-bird, as she called the lark, should appear in such high society. For to-day, however, she would allow it, and they must shut him in the empty cage that was standing in the window. "'Perhaps he will amuse my good Polly,' added the lady, looking with a benignant smile at a large green parrot that swung himself backwards and forwards most comfortably in his ring, inside a magnificent brass-wired cage. "'Today is Polly's birthday,' said she, with stupid simplicity, "'and the little brown field-bird must wish him joy.' Mr. Polly uttered not a syllable in reply, but swung to and fro with dignified condescension, while a pretty canary, as yellow as gold, that had lately been brought from his sunny fragrant home, began to sing aloud. "'Noisy creature! Will you be quiet?' screamed the lady of the house, covering the cage with an embroidered white pocket-handkerchief. "'Trrrp! Trrrp! sighed he. "'That was a dreadful snowstorm!' and he sighed again and was silent. The copying clerk, or, as the lady said, the brown field-bird, was put into a small cage, close to the canary and not far from my good Polly. The only human sounds that the parrot could bawl out were, "'Come, let us be men!' Everything else that he said was as unintelligible to everybody as the chirping of the canary, except to the clerk who was now a bird, too. He understood his companion perfectly. I flew about beneath the green palms and the blossoming almond trees, sang the canary. I flew around with my brothers and sisters, over the beautiful flowers and over the glassy lakes, where the bright water plants nodded to me from below. There, too, I saw many splendidly dressed paraquets that told the drollest stories and the wildest fairy tales without end. "'Oh, those were uncouth birds,' answered the parrot. "'They had no education, and talked of whatever came into their head. If my mistress and all her friends can laugh at what I say, so may you too, I should think. It is a great fault to have no taste for what is witty or amusing. Come, let us be men.' "'Ah!' You have no remembrance of love for the charming maidens that dance beneath the outspread tents beside the bright, fragrant flowers? Do you no longer remember the sweet fruits and the cooling juice in the wild plants of our never-to-be-forgotten home? said the former inhabitant of the Canary Isle, continuing his dithyrambic. Oh, yes, said the parrot, but I am far better off here. I am well fed and get friendly treatment. I know I'm a clever fellow, and that is all I care about. Come, let us be men. You are of a poetical nature, as it is called. I, on the contrary, possess profound knowledge and inexhaustible wit. You have genius, but clear-sighted, calm discretion does not take such lofty flights and utter such high natural tones. For this they have covered you over. They never do the like to me, for I cost more. Besides, they are afraid of my beak, and I have always a witty answer at hand. Come, let us be men. O oh, warm, spicy land of my birth, sang the canary bird. I will sing of thy dark green bowers, of the calm bays where the pendant boughs kiss the surface of the water. I will sing of the rejoicing of all my brothers and sisters, where the cactus grows in wanton luxuriance. Spare us your elegiac tones said the parrot, giggling. Rather speak of something at which one may laugh heartily. Laughing is an infallible sign of the highest degree of mental development. Can a dog or a horse laugh? No, but they can cry. 
the gift of laughing was given to man alone ha 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 screamed polly and added his stereotype witticism come let us be men poor little danish gray bird said the canary you have been caught too it is no doubt cold enough in your woods but there at least is the breath of liberty therefore fly away in the hurry they have forgotten to shut your cage and the upper window is open fly my friend fly away farewell instinctively the clerk obeyed with a few strokes of his wings he was out of the cage but at the same moment the door which was only a jar and which led to the next room began to creak and supple and creeping came the large tomcat into the room and begun to pursue him the frightened canary fluttered about in his cage the parrot flapped his wings and cried come let us be men the clerk felt a mortal fright and flew through the window far away over the houses and streets at last he was forced to rest a little the neighboring house had a something familiar about it a window stood open he flew in it was his own room he perched upon the table come let us be men said he involuntarily imitating the chatter of the parrot and at the same moment he was again a copying clerk but he was sitting in the middle of the table heaven help me cried he how did i get up here and so buried in sleep too after all that was a very unpleasant disagreeable dream that haunted me the whole story is nothing but silly stupid nonsense part six the best that the galoshes gave the following day early in the morning while the clerk was still in bed some one knocked at his door it was his neighbor a young divine who lived on the same floor he walked in lend me your galoshes said he it is so wet in the garden though the sun is shining most invitingly i should like to go out a little he got the galoshes and he was soon below in a little dewy decimo garden where between two immense walls a plum tree and an apple tree were standing even such a little garden as this was considered in the metropolis of copenhagen as a great luxury the young man wandered up and down the narrow paths as well as the prescribed limits would allow the clock struck six without was heard the horn of a postboy to travel to travel exclaimed he overcome by most painful and passionate remembrances that is the happiest thing in the world that is the highest aim of all my wishes then at last would the agonizing restlessness be allayed which destroys my existence but it must be far far away i would behold magnificent switzerland i would travel to italy and it was a good thing that the power of the galoshes worked as instantaneously as lightning in a powder magazine would do otherwise the poor man with his overstrained wishes would have travelled about the world too much for himself as well as for us in short he was travelling he was in the middle of switzerland but packed up with eight other passengers in the inside of an eternally creaking diligence his head ached till it almost split his weary neck could hardly bear the heavy load and his feet pinched by his torturing boots were terribly swollen he was in an intermediate state between sleep and waking at variance with himself with his company with the country and with the government in his right pocket he had his letter of credit in the left his passport and in a small leathern purse some double louis d'or carefully sewn up in the bosom of his waistcoat every dream proclaimed that one or the other of these valuables was lost wherefore he started up as in a fever and the first movement which his hand made described a magic triangle from the right pocket to the left and then up toward the bosom to feel if he had them all safe or not from the roof inside the carriage umbrellas walking sticks hats and sundry other articles were depending and hindered the view which was particularly imposing he now endeavored as well as he was able to dispel his gloom which was caused by outward chance circumstances merely 
and on the bosom of nature imbibed the milk of purest human enjoyment grand solemn and dark was the noble landscape around the gigantic pine forests on the pointed crags seemed almost like little tufts of heather colored by the surrounding clouds it began to snow a cold wind blew and roared as though it were seeking a bride ah sighed he were we only on the other side of the alps then we should have summer and i could get my letters of credit cashed the anxiety i feel about them prevents me enjoying switzerland oh, were but i on the other side and so saying he was on the other side in italy between florence and rome lake thracemini illumined by the evening sun lay like flaming gold between the dark blue mountain ridges here where hannibal defeated flaminius the rivers now held each other in their green embraces lovely half-naked children tended a herd of black swine beneath a group of fragrant laurel trees hard by the roadside could we render this inimitable picture properly then would everybody exclaim beautiful unparalleled italy but neither the young divine said so nor any of his grumbling companions in the coach of the vetturino the poisonous flies and gnats swarmed around by thousands in vain one waved myrtle branches about like mad the audacious insect population did not cease to sting nor was there a single person in the well-crammed carriage whose face was not swollen and sore from their ravenous bites the poor horses tortured almost to death suffered most from this truly egyptian plague the flies alighted upon them in large disgusting swarms and if the coachman got down and scraped them off hardly a minute elapsed before they were there again the sun now set a freezing cold though of short duration pervaded the whole creation it was like a horrid gust coming from a burial vault on a warm summer's day but all around the mountains retained that wonderful green tone which we see in some old pictures and which should we not have seen a similar play of color in the south we declare at once to be unnatural it was a glorious prospect but the stomach was empty the body tired all that the heart cared and longed for was good-night quarters yet how would they be for these one looked much more anxiously than for the charms of nature which everywhere were so profusely displayed the road led through an olive grove and here the solitary inn was situated ten or twelve crippled beggars had encamped outside the healthiest of them resembled to use an expression of marriott's hunger's eldest son when he had come of age the others were either blind had withered legs and crept about on their hands or withered arms and fingerless hands it was the most wretched misery dragged from among the filthiest rags excellencia miserabili sighed they thrusting forth their deformed limbs to view even the hostess with bare feet uncombed hair and dressed in a garment of doubtful color received the guests grumblingly the doors were fastened with a loop of string the floor of the rooms presented a stone paving half torn up bats fluttered wildly about the ceiling and as to the smell therein no that was beyond description you had better lay the cloth below in the stable said one of the travellers there at all events one knows what one is breathing the windows were quickly opened to let in a little fresh air quicker however than the breeze the withered sallow arms of the beggars were thrust in accompanied by the eternal whine of miserably miserably excellence on the walls were displayed innumerable inscriptions written in nearly every language of europe some in verse some in prose most of them not very laudatory of bella italia the meal was served it consisted of a soup of salted water seasoned with pepper and rancid oil the last ingredient played a very prominent part in the salad stale eggs and roasted cock's combs furnished the grand dish of the repast the wine even was not without a disgusting taste it was like a medicinal draught 
At night, the boxes and other effects of the passengers were placed against the rickety door. One of the travelers kept watch while the others slept. The sentry was our young divine. How close it was in the chamber, the heat oppressive to suffocation, the gnats hummed and stung unceasingly, the miserably without whined and moaned in their sleep. Traveling would be agreeable enough, said he, groaning, if one only had no body, or could send it to rest while the spirit went on its pilgrimage unhindered, whither the voice within might call it. Wherever I go, I am pursued by a longing that is insatiable, that I cannot explain to myself, and that tears my very heart. I want something better than what is, but what is fled in an instant. But what is it? And where is it to be found? Yet I know in reality what it is I wish for. Oh, most happy were I, could I but reach one aim could but reach the happiest of all. And as he spoke the word, he was again in his home. The long white curtains hung down from the windows, and in the middle of the floor stood the black coffin. In it he lay in the sleep of death. His wish was fulfilled. The body rested, while the spirit went unhindered on its pilgrimage. Let no one deem himself happy before his end, were the words of Salon. And here was a new and brilliant proof of the wisdom of the old apophthegm. Every corpse is a sphinx of immortality. Here, too, on the black coffin, the sphinx gave us no answer to what he who lay within had written two days before. O mighty death, thy silence teaches not. Thou leadest only to the near grave's brink. Is broken now the ladder of my thoughts? Do I, instead of mounting, only sink? Our heaviest grief the world oft seeth not. Our sorest pain we hide from stranger eyes, and for the sufferer there is nothing left but the green mound that o'er the coffin lies. Two figures were moving in the chamber. We knew them both. It was the fairy of care and the emissary of fortune. They both bent over the corpse. "'Do you now see,' said Care, "'what happiness your galoshes have brought to mankind? "'To him, at least, who slumbers here, "'they have brought an imperishable blessing,' answered the other. "'Ah, no,' replied Care. "'He took his departure himself. "'He was not called away. His mental powers here below were not strong enough to reach the treasures lying beyond this life, and which his destiny ordained he should obtain. I will now confer a benefit on him. And she took the galoshes from his feet. His sleep of death was ended, and he, who had been thus called back again to life, arose from his dread couch in all the vigor of youth. Care vanished, and with her the galoshes. She has no doubt taken them for herself, to keep them to all eternity. End of the Shoes of Fortune, Chapter 4b